landscaping. Now, landscaping in the mountains of West Virginia means you're mowing lawns or you're shoveling snow. Now, why they would put a 60-year-old woman to do that, I don't, is not normal, but I was a lesbian, and no, they told me, you're not gonna get a good job because you came out. So they put me in front of a lawnmower, which is from like 1950, the kind that you have to pull, you know, it's a start, not a button. And of course, I am not handy at all. So I'm standing, all the other women are started and I'm still pulling, it's a disaster. And the, the women who were the most protective of me were really the black women who were around 30 years old because I looked like their mother or their grandmother. And so they sh I couldn't even move this machine. So they would move the machine and do my work for me. And once they caught us, which took them about three days, they put me on the task of sweeping the pebbles off the streets. Pebbles this big with a broom. So I'm standing in 100 degree heat and I'm, I'm doing my job. And I have a hard time breathing because I have asthma. And being out in that kind of weather is tough. <coughs> then I said to the guy who's in charge of landscaping, why don't we just take a crane and get rid of all these pebbles in one shot? Because every time a truck went by them, I, where I moved them, they'd come back on the, the street. So I said, but if I did that, you wouldn't have a job. Which was the most moronic thing I ever heard. Um, now prior to my um, incarceration, I was born Jewish, but I did not observe except for high holidays, which is twice a year. And when I went to prison by, and I was not alone, a lot of people who grew up a certain religion but didn't really um, worship on a daily basis. Second day I was in prison, I had, it, I had to have a prayer book. I never had to have a prayer book in my life. But you have to draw on something to keep your strength. And I didn't know I would ever draw on a prayer book. And there's a prayer that we say on, on a Saturday that I started to say like all day, all day, 10, 20 times. <clears throat> and I started to ascend 10 weekly services. Um, and I, if you had asked me would I ever do that, and I'll tell you to this day I still do it. I didn't do it for 59 years of my life, but in, in prison you need to rely, rely on something. Um, I won my first appeal, uh, which was nine months into the sentence. My convictions were overturned. And at around four o'clock in the afternoon, a officer said, Litwak, get up here. And I had, no, I had no idea why she was calling me. I'd heard from my appellate attorney weeks before, and he said it went as good as it could have been, but it could take months before you get a decision. So she called me in and she said, the Second Circuit has ordered you released. You have to be out of here in one hour. You, you fucked up my dinner plans. Not an ounce of humanity, not congratulations, you're going home. Not a single, and then I had to be walked back to get my stuff. I had to be walked out of the compound. <clears throat> and not a single officer uh, said a kind word, said congratulations. But the women on the compound were going nuts because this is what's called immediate release. A red phone rings and everybody yells out, everybody knows someone's either being released or someone's getting punished. Every unit has these red phones. So when the red phone rang, everybody yelled out at me and we release. And when they saw I was really getting released, they <coughs> went crazy because it gives them hope, even if it's not realistic, that maybe that phone will ring for them that maybe someone's out there working for them and maybe it'll ring. So they literally throw you out of the prison. And I was standing in the middle of West Virginia with 11 boxes and having to wait for Greyhound for a whole day because I'm no longer under federal custody, I was free. And they don't, so they don't care. They put you on the street and, that, and you have to figure your way home. Okay, um, after two years of being free, 